Hi, Jeffrey. Um, today we have um, Jeffrey Moore on the Change Alchemist podcast. Uh, Jeffrey Moore needs no introduction. He's one of my heroes, both a business hero and a marketing hero. He's an author, speaker, and advisor. Um, he splits his time consulting between startup companies. He's also a venture partner at Wildcat Venture Partners. Um, and he's advised both startups as well as large corporations like Salesforce, Microsoft, Autodesk, uh, Google, Splunk, and, and the list goes on. Um, Jeffrey's work, Jeffrey Moore's work has focused on the market dynamics surrounding uh, disruptive innovations. And um, in his first book, Crossing the Chasm, which I'm sure all of the readers on this podcast um, have, have either read or uh, reread, you've had three editions so far, you focus in, in your uh, book on the challenges startup companies face, transitioning from early adoption to mainstream customers. So I think I'll, I'll pause there. I'd love to talk about your journey in Silicon Valley. Um, you started out as a literature major. You, you went to Stanford University and then you did a master's in University of Washington. You, uh, you even taught. So maybe you could talk about some of those early influences and how you moved into technology. Okay, well, thank you. Um, yeah, I was, I want, my, my career ambition was to be an English professor. And so I, uh, I went to, I was an English major and undergraduate. I got a master's and a PhD in English literature. I specialized in medieval and Renaissance literature. So not particularly relevant to the high tech sector at the, at the surface anyway. And I, did, and I did teach for four years in a small liberal arts college in Michigan, Olivet College. Um, Marie is, however, is from Palo Alto. Uh, we're an interracial couple. She's Filipino. I'm white. And so Michigan was not a good fit for us in the 70s. It was just a little bit of a challenge. So we came back to the Bay Area, but there were no jobs in, 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 in academics. So I just had to get a job someplace else. And I was lucky enough to get a job in a software company as a training director. And uh, that led to me as I got, got more and more involved. I got more interested in the sales and marketing side. I didn't think I was going to be a coder. So if you didn't make it, you probably ought to sell it. was sort of my thinking there. And I spent 10 years with three different companies and I learned a ton. I was, uh, I was never a very successful salesperson. I was terrific at opening. I wasn't very good at closing. And so someone along the line said, well, you know, that sounds more like marketing than sales. Mm -hmm. And when I got into marketing, I joined a, a company called Regis McKenna, which was the sort of premier high tech PR agency of that era. And that was just an invaluable experience for me. I mean, as soon as I got there, it was like I was home. And, uh, and that's where I was able to work with enough companies to see the patterns that led to writing Crossing the Chasm, which was my first book. And it was, you know, it was all about those challenges. And, and we were living them at Regis McKenna every day with our clients. And so it was very helpful. So this, you wrote Cross, Crossing the Chasm 25 years ago, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah, 19, well, let's see. It came out in 1990. So maybe 20, 20 years ago, no, 30 years ago, 30 years ago. And um, it's a bestseller and I've, I've read it. Yeah, it, it, read it's it. Actually, yeah, it's actually sold over a million copies over the years. It, it, um, it, it's been, it just, I think that the framework has just really held up. It's particularly strong at helping B2B and B2, B2B to C companies. It's not really a consumer marketing book. It's much more of a business to business marketing book. Um, but the frameworks have held up very well, and so uh, I've had to re I've had to uh, revise it twice because the examples didn't hold up. The companies changed so fast in high tech that about every ten years you got to go. Okay, I got to have a whole new cast of characters. But I didn't actually rewrite any of the logic of the book. I just wrote, rewrote the examples. Okay, good. So, did you think when you wrote it that um, we would still be reading it and uh, CEOs would still be uh, getting words of wisdom from you at th this point? You know, no. I mean, when I wrote it, for, when I wrote it, um, I, I wasn't even a partner at Regis McKenna. I was just a principal. I was just trying to write kind of a playbook for product managers who were who had these products, and, and they, sometimes they were like in the middle of the corporation. They weren't the vice president or the CEO, but they owned a product. And it was a disruptive innovation. It was a disruptive technology. And they kept on having this situation where they have these early successes and these great customers and they go, wow, this is it. We, we, we're, we've made it, it's, it's done. And they pour on the gas and the big marketing programs, hire a bunch of salespeople and then boom, and they sort of fall on their face. And so after a while I was like, well, that, that hurts. Uh, and, and so what, what's going on here? And so the pattern of, of the chasm and this whole notion of early adopters 
versus the early majority and how different they really are and, and what, what it takes to win with one is so different from what it takes to win with the other. So that change in culture and focus that's required to cross the chasm, you know, it was easy for me to see it because I was going from company to company to company to company to company. When I was actually before that, in those three companies I was in before I became a marketing consultant, I actually took products into the chasm and none out. I mean, because I, and I thought it was my fault. In fact, we all thought it was our fault. And so part of the chasm, I think, was about uh, just getting redeemed. I mean, it was sort of like, well, okay, we probably could have done better, but there's something structural going on here. It's just not, not, it's not that we're all, you know, bozos. So it, was, it felt good. It's fabulous. So uh, the crossing the chasm is primarily targeted at startups, right? You yes, that's get... pretty, yeah. The, the idea behind crossing the chasm is nobody's heard of you. You have a really exciting, well, you're venture capitalist. Maybe they've heard of your venture capitalist, but they haven't heard of you. And, uh, and you, um, you've got something incredibly exciting. And the early, the early market, the people, there are technology enthusiasts and visionaries who make up what we call the early market. And they both kind of get you. They, they, in fact, they're excited by you. They're, 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 they, 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 they gravitate toward you. They believe what you believe. They think this is the next big thing, or at least could be, and they want in on it. And so that early market is so uh, emotionally fulfilling because everybody's kind of on the same side. Uh, and, uh, and so you can get some early wins that, you, that make you think, I'm master of the universe. Uh, but it's actually with a very, a very specialized cohort. And so as soon as you go outside of that little bubble and kind of wander out into the pragmatic real world, it's like then, then you have, a, you have a, a series of lessons to learn. And then you talk about the tornado, which is when you uh, hit the mass majority. Yeah, so it's very interesting. So, so the, the people who are not in the early market, the people who they call the early majority, we call them the pragmatists. Pragmatists, the way they make buying decisions is they say, look, I'm not an expert in this. The, the, the PowerPoint looks good, the demo looks fabulous, but you know, we, we know that's not always the, the whole story. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk to my peers and I'm going to ask them, you know, are, have, you, have you tried this? And if I say, if they say, well, not yet, I'll say, well, okay, I'll, I'll wait too. And that's what creates the chasm. The chasm is just the pragmatist saying, I'm interested, I'd like to learn more, I might even pilot it in some tiny little application, but it's too soon for me to make a commitment. I have a career and, 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 I, and I want to protect the career. So that's the chasm. The tornado is the app, it's just flipping that. Now all of a sudden you have the fear of moving out, the FOMO thing, right? Fear of missing out. So you say, you're doing it, you're doing it. Oh my gosh, I got to do it too. And at that point, everybody rushes into the market and, and there's all of a sudden everybody has budget for the new category and everybody's talking about well, who are you going to buy. And so and, and that, and that we call that the tornado because all of a sudden the category inflates so fast that anybody in the category gets a huge lift. So um, do you feel like uh, COVID and the recent uh, events um, have, have actually accelerated innovation in the Valley or do you feel like we're at a sort of um, uh, in a holding pattern. What are your thoughts on how the pandemic has impacted innovation? It's, it, I think the biggest thing, and I think I see this, I hear this a lot from the companies I consult with, as well as the CIOs I spend time with. What the pandemic has done more than anything else is accelerated digital transformation in the customer base. Because everybody has to work from home, uh, a lot of these things, which they were, you know, they had a five year plan for, became a five month plan. And so anybody in the Valley who's part of the digital transformation sort of solution set, their business has actually accelerated dramatically. Now, if you're not, if you're, if you're part of clean energy or you're part of biotech or you're part of something else, you, you know, it maybe went the other way. So it's not, it's, I don't think it's been even, but I do think that the, and, and particularly, uh, I think what COVID has shown us because of the pressure on the healthcare system, it showed us with telemedicine and then, of course, the fact that we're trying to do education from home, so remote learning, that two things it showed us over and over again. One is this medium, we can do a lot with virtual stuff that we didn't know. And two, it's not a complete solution. I mean, if you have any kids who are trying to learn through remote education, it's not a complete solution. And same thing with telemedicine. You, 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 it's not. But the fact that it could be as powerful as it can be, I think, has been a wake up call for everybody. So I think which kind of leads to our, your concept of the whole product, right? You can have a product, but then you have to look at the 
Maybe you could talk a little bit about the whole product because that's a beautiful concept. Well, it, it, so the, it, it, it's so relevant to both medicine and education. Let's do education because I, I think everybody here either has kids or knows people or have grandkids or whatever. It's right. cool. Mm -hmm. So you look at something like Zoom or, or any of the other video things, you say, great product. I mean, just great product. But does the teacher have lessons plans for it? Mm -hmm. Who's going to supervise the child? What do you do when a child's crying? How, how do you, you know, what's playtime supposed to be about? And, and the whole product would be something that we will probably have, not for another year or two, but we're hoping as fast as possible. What's, what's the complete curriculum day look like? What are all the tools besides video that you can use to, you know, accelerate education or keep the child on the thing? And, and the same thing would be with medicine. So, so, you know, the whole, like you want to say, well, I, I, if we're having virtual medicine, well, Jeffrey's going to take care of himself at home. Well, who's going to monitor his pulse? Or, well, you have a Fitbit. Oh, okay. And then, and then who's, going to, well, who's going to read the Fitbit? And, and, and you, again, you, as you look at the whole product, what you're trying to say in every case is, if you're going to achieve the objective of the purchase, what besides the product is necessary in order to do it? If I'm going to educate the child, what besides the video conference with the teacher is required? If I'm going to keep Jeffrey healthy, what besides you know, the, 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 the video check-ins is, is going to be required? That was the whole product. Yeah, and then, then, then you get into, hey, which is the core and what's the context, right? And then... That's a great, that core context, it became so important because core, you know, in the whole product, there's lots of stuff, but not all, the, the part that is that we call core is the part that's differentiating, the part that makes the difference. So in this, in, you know, in, in the case of the, of the working from home, I think there's no question that Zoom is core. Or, or, or WebEx or Google Hangouts or, or Teams or whatever you want to use. But the video conferencing is core. But there's all this other stuff. And, and, and for, the, for, the, for Eric Yuan at, at Zoom, for example, he should just focus on the video. But, but his ecosystem of partners can focus on the, what we call the context. And so the way we work with core and context, and we're particularly, it's important, particularly important for startups who have very limited resources, you want to spend as much of your resources on core as you can to be as differentiated as you possibly could be. And you want to leave to the partner ecosystem as much to the context as you can so that because that's on their balance sheet, it's not yours. The key to that, of course, is that the partners have to want to work with you. And so what you realize, and this is where we got into this whole thing and crossing the chasm about focus on a single use case in a single market. Because we want to be able to show that partner ecosystem is Hey, I'm the leader. And I'm not the leader everywhere, but in this market, in this geography, with this use case, I'm the leader. And then the partners go, oh, well, then we'll work with you. And that's what starts your ecosystem. And that if until you get an ecosystem, you're kind of like a hermit crab without a shell. You, you, <laughs> you need the whole thing. <laughs> I know part of part of why your book is books have been so successful is I think you you bring these real world analogies to a business um, setting, and I, I find that fascinating. Well, that's back to my, I think, maybe a little bit of the English literature major stuff. <laughs> you talked a lot about innovation, uh, Jeffrey, and um, you've done, you know, work with both startups and large companies. And one of the things you've said is the most common misunderstanding of disruptive innovation is to overestimate their impact in the short term and underestimate it in the long term. And another a misunderstanding is, is to associate disruptive with good. So maybe you could talk about innovation and the frameworks people should use while looking at disruptive and sustaining innovation. Yeah, actually that first quote, I think it might be Bill Gates or someone, but it, it wasn't me, but it's, it's, a, it's a very important. And it's true over and over again, we do. We, we overestimate it in the, in the short term, which creates bubbles, but we underestimate it in the long term, which creates revolutions, right? But so, and, and I would say that, yeah, this, I think Silicon Valley in particular because we tend to be technological enthusiasts, we tend to be early adopters. We tend to think that the disruptive innovations is always good and it's the good stuff. And people who are pragmatists or even God forbid conservatives in terms of adopting technology, they must lack IQ and they must, you know, obviously we're the smart people and they're not. That's just baloney. It's just, it's just, it's just completely wrong. So disruptive innovation is particularly important when the current status quo is holding us back. So, in other words, for a lot of places, the status quo is a huge asset. I mean, the fact that we have highways, you know, they're not holding us back. We can, we can drive to where we want to go. But occasionally you get to a situation where you go, well, yeah, but toll roads in the east 
is holding us back. So how can we figure? And so we took technology and said, well, what if you put a little device in your car and you could just drive right through? Mm -hmm. Ah, good. Okay. So that was a disruptive innovation, and it it it, it put some toll takers out of work. You know, I mean, I mean, and it, it that was bad, but but it but it clearly was was a good thing. And so I think sustaining innovation and disruptive innovation. It, 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 the, the sustaining innovation for most of the time is the right bet because you don't want to disrupt all the time or you won't get anything done. You want to disrupt and then you want to sustain, 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 uh oh, trap, okay, disrupt. Uh, and, and so, um, I, and I think in Silicon Valley, because we like disruptive innovation, we also have put a premium on leadership, which is what you need when you're disrupting. And we tend to not put enough of premium on management which is what you need when you're sustaining. So when you're running a core business in a sustaining way, you want good management. Um, Tim Cook, right? When you're disrupting, you want Steve Jobs. <laughs> but, but Steve Jobs would not do Tim Cook's job very well. In other words, it's important to respect both jobs. So, um, so this, but disruptive innovation can happen in large companies too. If you look at Microsoft moving to the cloud, I mean, they've moved their Office 365, which was on-prem, uh, although they had to cannibalize, I think they did it. I mean, can you give some examples where it could be useful? Well, this is important. And this is actually, my latest book is called Zone to Win. Uh -huh. It's about the same market development challenges that Crossing the Chasm and Inside the Tornado were about. But instead of looking at it from the perspective of a startup, it's looking at it from the perspective of a public company. And the big difference there is that startups are typically funded by venture capital and other forms of private equity who are willing to lose money in the short term in order to make a bigger bet for the long term. And that's sort of the way, that's the whole economics of venture capital. That's not true of public corporations. Public shareholders are not willing to lose money in the short term in order to make money for the long term. And so large companies have a big challenge. They know they need to innovate. They start innovating. They get, and, and initially it works well because they've got bright people. It's not that they don't know how to innovate, but at some point you've got to make this, uh, this, this uh, investment commitment and it makes your performance measures all look, go down, not up. And the, you have to report your performance every quarter in the stock market. And so the, your, the, your investors get restless, your board of directors gets restless. And you, you get halfway into these things and they say, look, this is not, you got to stop. And so they do, they stop or they sideline it or whatever, which is incredibly destructive. The most destructive thing you can do to a company is start a disruption, get halfway in and then quit. You're much better off never going. It, 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 but but it, so the book Zone to Win starts with 56 companies, iconic companies in tech, crushed it the first time, do not exist today. Because they because every time they tried to get that catch that second wave, they couldn't. So what the book's about is saying, okay, enough's enough. How do we crack this code? And it talks about very the understanding that there are various zones of interest inside a corporation. There are three that are permanent and one that's temporary. And each has its own management model. And you can't use, you, you can't use one zone's management model to evaluate the progress or the, or the work of another zone. And so the two zones that all public companies have all the time, we call the performance zone, which is their sales and product revenues, and the productivity zone, which is all their cost center functions, finance, HR, IT, legal. It's 95% of the, of the people in any large company are either in the performance zone or the productivity zone. The incubation zone, which is where you work with the next generation disruptive stuff, it, what we've just learned about that is in the 20th century, big companies had a laboratory model for that. Bell Labs, IBM Labs, Xerox PARC. That didn't work. The, the reason it didn't work was great technology. I mean, the, the Macintosh came out of Xerox PARC, right? But couldn't, couldn't get it to market because the, the distance between the lab and the performance zone is just is too big. So what we've learned in the 21st century is you got to run the incubation zone the way a venture capital fund runs their businesses. Not, now you're not a venture capitalist and you're not trying to make venture capital returns, but you, 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 fund, you fund these things like they're startups. You, you give them a, an entire team, not just engineers. They have salespeople, they have, but you keep it small. And, and, you, and by the way, you have very restricted distribution. None of their products can be sold in the performance zone. They all have to be sold by special in special sales teams in the incubation zone to a very specific set of customers who have been told this is not our normal contract. We, the, this is not our normal quality. This is next generation stuff. So understand you're working with, you're working with, the, with the next generation here. 
And you can do that. And, and, and just putting that zone in place is a big step up. And then the other thing is the transformation zone. That's the one that's temporary. And that's if you say, okay, guys, we have to go. Now, in the case of Microsoft, you mentioned, and this is true of most large companies, Microsoft didn't voluntarily go to the cloud. Microsoft was crushing it with, and Microsoft had no want, reason to change at all. But what happened was Amazon showed up and, you, and, and all of a sudden the back office software business, which is what Satya Nadella was running, uh, you realized, well, we're not gonna have a back office software business if the world goes to the cloud because people won't buy our software, they'll buy whatever the cloud guy gives them. And then the people running office, and at the time I got there, it was a guy named Chi Lu. You know, Satya said to Chi, look, mobile first, cloud first, you, you got to get Office into this new world as well. And so that was Office 365. And then Windows never got there. They, 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 by the time it came to do Windows, the mobile operating system was so, so between iOS and Android, Windows had like 20% of the edge instead of like 90%. So the, what, what Microsoft taught, taught me is that most companies go through a transformation under threat. Not because, which we always like to write about, well, look what Jeff Bezos did, or look what Reed Hastings did, or look what, you know, Larry Ellison did, or whatever. Yes, there are these amazing people who voluntarily disrupt themselves, but that is an incredible exception. The much more common is, if I don't jump on this bandwagon, I'm, I'm out of business. And even that, but even then, you have to go down before you go up. And, and the, the, the Microsoft had the courage of its convictions and, and Adobe when they had, when the cloud had the courage of their convictions. And that's, that's what it takes. Yeah, no, I think it's interesting that the big companies are, um, are they need a model too. And I think the zone to win, I haven't read it, but certainly uh, I think it's worthwhile. Uh, looking it's, at it's, it. it's helped, what, what models are for, Shimana, is, is to, to give people a vocabulary to talk about a challenge, a politically or emotionally or just economically challenging topic in a way that honors all sides of the argument. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the opposite of our political spectrum right now. I mean, <laughs> if you want to be successful in business, you, you absolutely want to honor all points of view. And this is what diversity, this is a really important dimension of diversity. You know, we, we think about gender diversity and we think about ethnic diversity, both of which are incredibly important, but so is intellectual diversity. And, and, and being able to sort of triangulate on a tough problem by looking at it in multiple sides. So what a framework's designed to do is to show you there are multiple legitimate points of view to bring to this problem, and you should not disempower or disenfranchise any of the points of view. At some point, you're gonna make a bet, you're gonna take an action, and, and that's fine, and you'll, you will take an action from a specific point of view, good, but just understand that, that, that put that in context, and when you go to recruit, the rest of the company to back that bet, they have to understand, you know, we're, I'm backing a bet in somebody else's zone. They're not going to play by the rules that I play by because they're playing a different game. And I have to honor that. In fact, I have to support that. And that, I think if you have the right vocabulary and framework, you go, oh yeah, okay, I, I, I get it. It's a little bit like families, right? You know, I, I've got a grandson, he's, he's, he's six years old. He's got a set of rules. I can't give him the keys to the car. <laughs> I've got a great aunt who's, who's potentially de had dementia. I have to think about how to play that game. I have to honor that game. You know, just play the game. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. You've advised a lot of startup uh, founders. Maybe you're a CEO, a, a whisperer, CMO whisperer. Um, what are some sort of um, good stories uh, you can tell, success stories, and, and maybe also a couple of stories where you felt like they should have never have even been at the chasm, they, they didn't even have product market fit to start with. Well, you know, it, it is interesting. So, so the <laughs> fun things, just kind of classic things that happen. So, so um, one thing that happens is, you know, you sit down with a team and you're doing, you put out this chasm framework and you say, okay, so where do we think the category is? And, you know, everybody say, well, you know, it's in the chasm and, and, and the founder's going, it's in the tornado. It's like, no, it's not. But, but, you know, when you're a believer and when you want it to be there and when you can see it in your mind, and then you, it, it's so hard to, 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 to listen to the universe and, but where are we, where are we really? And, and, and what happens in large companies is they acquire these incredibly cool assets 
and the CEO typically sponsors the acquisition, and then he immediately puts it in the performance zone because he wants it to scale. And it's like, no, 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 you just put my six-year-old grandson behind a, a Mack truck wheel. I mean, yes, he likes trucks and he'd love to drive a truck. He's six years old. <laughs> Don't let him do it. <laughs> and so, uh, and then of course they, they, they crash and they, and they burn. So I think, um, I think one lesson is just, it's really important to let a, let a innovation have its time in the early market, its time in what we call the niche markets, or we call it the bowling alley, before you try to shove it into a tornado or, 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 or into a large, so, so that's one thing. Um, I think, uh, I think that, uh, one thing that's kind of interesting is the number of people that, um, that misunderstand venture capital and misunderstand venture funding. Uh, and, 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 and part of it is and there's these radical disappointments. And then there's, there are venture capitalists that are not good people. So, I mean, let's understand there's some bad stories. But there's a fundamental misunderstanding about what, how, what does the venture funding mean? And, and, and the, so there was a, f a fellow at the Wildcat Ventures named Bruce Cleveland who wrote a book called The Traction Gap. And, and he and I collaborated on some parts of it. But the idea behind that was venture funding is designed to get you to the next milestone. And the next milestone is something that changes the value of your company dramatically. So if, you get, so if you're raising funding now and I, and I say, well, I mean, you're going to get $2 million on an $8 million valuation. If you get to the next milestone with that $2 million, we're planning on raising maybe you know, $6 million at $30 million valuation or $40 million valuation. And so the point is, but you've got to get to the milestone. If you only get 90% of the way, what happens is people go, well, you know, good company. I'll put some money in, but not at the new valuation. I'll put it in at the old valuation because you didn't get to the milestone. So that notion of milestone-based funding and, and, and tying a milestone, not to just a check the box, hey, I released the product or blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. Did you achieve a new position of power in the world because you did get marquee customers. You did get your first crossing the chasm beachhead market. You, then, then, wow. And I think, I think just thinking that way, and therefore, when you get money as a startup, you got to realize, if I, if, I, if I need more money than what I just got, it's coming out of my ownership. And, 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 and so I better get to that next milestone. No, a valid point, uh, which kind of brings me to my next question, um, which is, um, if you were to make one prediction about, you know, the future, and, and we, like, I, I'll, I'll sit down with you in five years. Uh, what do you think it might be? What do you think? It, let's kind of narrow it down about the future of work. Um, how do you think that might might turn out? Well, we're 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 in the middle of a of a of a huge sort of almost half a century long transformation from an industrial model to a post industrial model. And 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 uh, so if we again looking at it in context, because um, because the jobs in an industrial model. They're, they're, they're location specific, you go to work, you, you, they tend to organize around products, things, which you build in factories and then ship to stores and then sell through stores and maintain and whatever. And increasingly in this, in this more post-industrial digital services world, you don't necessarily go to work. You, we're not going to work this year, for example, but we, we're at work, but we didn't go to work. Um, many of the products are, are, are services that are really not products. In fact, we're trying to consume more of our products as services. So it's a whole generation of people that don't want to buy a car. They want to buy ride sharing. I mean, I'll, I'll do it that way. I don't need to you know, own, own a vacation home. I'll go to Airbnb, you know, those kinds of things. So, so at, at the large sense, and, and, and if you go even higher than that, what it says is in the industrial model, product was king and the supply chain which is where you spend all your time improving things. In this post-industrial model, the customer is much more, it's the customer is king era. And, and so now we're spending all our time focusing on the customer. Well, now let's think about what that's gonna do to the future of work. If in the, Cause in the old days, the customer had to wait in line. I mean, basically we, we did our work and you, know, you went to the, wherever it was, you stood in line, filled out a form and did whatever you were told to do and that was it. Okay, in this new world, it's like, no, we have to court the customer. We have to continually improve customer experience is this whole thing, right? Customer success, not tech support, customer success. Well, think about the kind of jobs, how that changes jobs. So in the product model, I want a technical expert who knows the product. 
But in the services model, I want somebody who has more EQ than IQ, who gets the customer, who can pick up on signals, and, and, and who can make give them a better sales experience, a better support experience, a better marketing experience, much more experience oriented. Frankly, in terms of gender, it plays more to the female gender than the male gender, just like the other one played more to the male gender than the female. Obviously, it's not gender specific. We're all, we all can do both jobs. But if you look at what's going to happen to the future of work, it's going to be much more democratized, I think, across the gender spectrum. And I think we're going to see a lot more female leadership, which I think we, it's about time. Uh, so I think it'll be great. Um, but but, but, I, but I, think it's, I think it's going to be part just because this model plays to, to, to a different set of strengths. You talked about customer experience, and that's quite near and dear to my heart. So if you took something like a CRM system and you added a you know, AI chatbot to it, do you think AI is going to play into the future of work? Or do you think they'll still be? Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. So, so I think, and, and this is what we've learned something about from Amazon, I think it's brilliant. So when we tend to think about user experience, we tend to think about Apple, and we tend to think about delighters. And by the way, I don't think anybody did delighters better than Apple. Amazon doesn't exactly do delighters. What Amazon did is it looked at all of the dissatisfiers, all the things that what we sometimes used to call hygiene factors. Mm -hmm. And it just said, well, what if we re-engineered the system to not have that? What if we, you, know, you don't have to go to the store, we'll send it to you. You don't have to put in your charge cards. You're a prime membership, we won't charge you. I mean, and, and so what, what that says is, when you look at the customer experience, there's two kinds of things. There's, can you give them a unique experience? And that I think plays to human beings. And I don't think that plays to AI. But can you take all the other stuff, maybe the context, not the core, and just, and just take it away, just strip it away? AI is brilliant at that. Machine learning is brilliant at that. Um, now, right now, we're, we're, we're the, most people know machine learning largely from their advertising experience. We have abused, we've abused machine learning in ad tech. I mean, just, it, it, it's just it's abusive. Uh, and we need to stop. Because a we're getting we're getting inured to it, immune to it. It doesn't work. I mean, it sort of works, but it works like with a, like a sledgehammer. Uh, and, and b we're misunderstanding what machine learning can be. I mean, there's so much that's such a rich uh, uh, resource. So I I, I think um, going back to your CRM example, giving the the salesperson or the support person cl uh, suggestions about next best action or next best thing to say. Thank God bless you. And, and, and the reason we can do that is because of this incredible move, because we've moved to digital, we, everything digital has a log file. You, it's impossible to do anything digitally without creating a log file. We just used to have those log files. We, well, you throw them away after 30 days, right? I mean, who, who wanted them? Uh, maybe for forensic analysis. Well, then the guys at Google said, no, 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 no. We're gonna do search. We're never gonna throw away a search argument. I thought, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Where are you gonna put all that stuff? Well, they, they've solved that problem. And then the point is when you have that much data and you expose it to algorithmic analysis through machine learning, the machine sees patterns that you would never see because they're just, they're too vast, it's too, needles and haystacks. And so as a result, we're getting more predictive about things that used to be, used to require either experience or intuition. And now machine learning is going, well, actually, no, you can use analytics if you have enough data. If you, have a, if you give yourself enough data uh, uh, over enough uh, trials, we will find the patterns in, in, in the noise, and those patterns can then inform future behaviors and create better experiences. Fascinating. Um, and now for, for startups starting maybe um, starting out or um, you know, maybe going towards the chasm, um, do you feel like our cancel culture and our social media uh, usage will actually detract the mass majority? Do you feel like any of the, the social impact will kind of play a negative role in kind of helping or hurting them? Yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I think social media is a classic herd phenomenon. I think that if you're gonna be in a startup, we use this word entrepreneur, but we, we don't tend to think about what it really means because an entrepreneur is willing to go against the current. And, and, and then they, they listen to the current, they're not stupid, but they're willing to go against the current. And, 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 and it, that takes courage, and particularly if that current, part of that current, if your spouse is being influenced by the same thing, and you, they're kind of, you're getting, well, you, what are you doing? And, and you say, well, I'm, I'm trying to be an entrepreneur. And they're going, well, yeah, but we have kids and we got this little bill of house to pay for. You can see all the anxiety. But I think what the entrepreneurial spirit says is, but I'm on a mission. I've, I've got to do this. 
And, and I think one of the things that helps is don't make it about you. Uh, even if in some part of you, it is about you, you've, you got to make it about something that matters more than you do and, and put yourself in service to whatever that thing is, because you're going to make sacrifices and you're going to make mistakes. And if you want to get back on course, you got to continually say, well, okay, so where did I let my mission down? How do I redirect to get more on more on whatever it is I'm trying to do? And whatever I'm trying to do is not just, you know, get rich cash out and go, you know, live the life of a, uh, of a cyber. I, I, I need to, I need to get something done in the world. And, and, and that really does help. That's great. I see a lot of books on your bookshelf. Uh, maybe you could, and you've written a few. So uh, can you kind of give me a sense of the top three books uh, that have influenced you, top three books you liked? Um, well, here is, so, because so, I don't, I, although I write business books, I don't read business books very often. So what has influenced me? And, and by the way, I, I do have a book coming out next year, which yeah. is the first book that's not about business at all. It, it's called The Infinite Staircase. And, and it's about, you know, a strategist view. What does the universe teach us about life, ethics, and, and mortality? I mean, so it's a ph philosophical book. Most of the books behind me tend to be more in that genre. I love reading about uh, molecular biology. I, I, if, if I were to go back and take a different major in, in time, or if I were to be 20 years old right now, I find molecular biology fascinating. Um, uh, I used to read a lot in Darwinism and, and, and sort of those kinds of things. Uh, some history, but, but and I still like liter uh, the, the literature. I, actually, okay, for those, if this, this is completely, there's zero overlap between your audience and this next statement, what the heck. So Beowulf, which is the original Old English poem, is a new translation out that was done by a woman this last year that is basically in kind of hip hop style language. And I studied Beowulf as a, deeply as a scholar. It works. And not only does it work for our culture, you think that's, that's probably exactly how the Anglo-Saxons experienced this poem. And all the ways we experienced in between were very, you know, senior and very uh, scholarly and, you know, we studied this. <laughs> it's like, no, no, these are more like football players, people. Come on. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's been fun. I think, I think you may actually be uh, onto something, right? I feel like we need diversity and we need people from liberal arts and other uh, disciplines coming into Silicon Valley. And, and maybe that's what we need. We need uh, more of a design thinking, interdisciplinary thinking, right? Yeah, I mean, I mean, yes. I mean, so look, I mean, at the core of Silicon Valley, well, it's really funny, by the way, we say Silicon, there's almost no Silicon left in Silicon Valley. I mean, it, 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 it's become all on top of the Silicon and all the software. Software really did eat the world. But you, the point being, look, at the core of this industry is technological innovation. And, and if you really go down all the way down, it's, it's because the semiconductor industry continues to give us more compute capability for less, less money and less time, then really the job of the tech industry is how can I take that free resource because basically it's just, you just get more power for the same amount. And how can I use that in some, consume that in some uh, highly useful way in the world? At the, at the far end, it means what, what applications will I apply it to? But in the near end, it's like, what, what does quantum computing do differently from other computing? Or how does a semiconductor laser work different than a gas laser? Or whatever it is. So, so I think at the core, you still need the engineers. Um, but, as, but as we move more toward the service economy, away, you know, away from the industrial product model, more toward digital services, a lot of the value creation is working backward from the customer, not forward from the product. And that is a different, and that is not, a, you do not learn that in engineering classes. And you, you learn that in humanities classes. And so we, yeah, I think we, as we're going to get more and more return on innovation, we've got to bring the technology from the left, but we've got to bring the user experience from the right. And that, that means, I think that there's got to be kind of a connection between the two. So if you were to characterize your superpower, what would it be? What do you think sets you apart? You've been, you're highly successful. looks like um, you've done a, so many different things. Um, is there one superpower you'd like to speak about? I think there's two things I, tr I think, I, I, think I, I rely on a great deal. Uh, one is sort of outward dire sense of direction. So the, the thing about being in service to something that I think is really worthy. <laughs> And I'm now at a point in my career, for example, where I get to work with the companies I want to work and the people I want to work with. And if it's not a fit, I don't have to do it. You know, there's a, there was a 
many times earlier in my career, it's like I would work with anybody because I, I needed the work and they need, well, you just, just do the work, right? So I, but I, the reason I, I mentioned that first one, it's because I need to be in service to something that I believe in. And, and, and then when I'm doing that, I, cause I, otherwise I get caught up in my own ego way too much. So, so that's, that, that's number one. And the second thing I think, think I, I, I really do think I'm good, I'm good at coming up with metaphors and, and I do it all the time, uh, just all the time. And it's just, it's just how I think. And, and I, think that's, I think that does make my writing business books a little bit different maybe than other ones. Uh, and, um, and you know, I, I think if, if, every, if, if every book you ever read was good at metaphors, you'd, you'd shoot yourself. But you know, as, 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 a, as an ingredient in a larger meal, I think, I think that's good. Yeah, I have, I still remember your D-Day metaphor from your Crossing the Chasm book. That, was, that stuck in my head because it's all about storytelling and metaphors. It, you know, I think that all problem solving starts with narratives. It, eventually, you have to translate the solution into practical actions and action items and OKRs and stuff like that. But at the beginning, you tell a story about a, 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 about a possible future and you seek to get investment, whether that's monetary investment from an investor or your team to invest their energy with you or your boss to align with your project. But, but you do that by telling stories. Now, and the way we criticize those stories is, and actually what your boss or your investor is doing is going, do I believe Shobana's story? Do I, do I believe this story she's told? <laughs> and, 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 and if they say yes, they get excited. If they say no, they think, well, then they ask you a question. Well, wait a minute. That doesn't sound right. What about blah, 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 blah. But if you come back and say, well, no, Jeffrey, actually, here's how it works. You go, oh, oh, maybe that story is a better story than I thought it was. And at some point, we buy into the story and then we translate the story into a spreadsheet. So we, we do come up with the metrics and we count sales and we count revenues. And we do all that stuff. But it's all analytics after the fact. N nobody got inspired by a spreadsheet. You know, they got measured by a spreadsheet, but they got inspired by PowerPoint. That's so true. That is so true. Um, and so if you were to kind of uh, provide guidance, advice to uh, listeners of this podcast, um, and maybe we could start with women, because it looks like, you know, we need allies, uh, women leaders need allies. Maybe we'll start with what, given that you advise a lot of VCs and, uh, you know, startups, what, what would you like to change and what advice would you like to provide? Well, I, I mean, I really do think we need a, a world which is much more balanced in terms of power. Uh, and by the way, work, I do a ton of work with Salesforce. I think Mark Benioff has been a, been a good leader there. If you look at the, sale, at the leadership team at Salesforce, it's more gender balanced than, than any other client I've ever worked with. And it's not just gender balanced, it's the voice. I mean, the, the, the powerful voice. Is, it, 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 there's a very good balance between, in fact, I would argue right now there's probably a stronger voice uh, from women than men right at the moment. But that, but that's great. About time, you know, isn't that isn't that fabulous? Uh, so I think that's that's part of it. I think it's it's when you are when you're in a situation though where the the social inertia still at the margin gives you the doubt of the benefit instead of the benefit of the doubt, and that's kind of first that's clearly how you wake up if you're black in America, and to some degree it's how you wake up if you're a female in business, certainly in tech business, and so and so it's like man, I have to get up every day and get the doubt of the benefit. I need, I need a little bit more of the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> and, and so, so, so when you start looking again, so part of it's get, you got to get back to who, who am I in service to? What am I in service to? Uh, maybe I'm just in service to making a living for my family and whatever, but you got to be, know what, what you're in service to and then, and then kind of protect that. And then, and then, you know, if you're getting the, the, the doubt of the benefit, I think you've got to protect your emotional energy. You gotta be careful because you, you, you just wear yourself out. I mean, I, I can remember t I was at, when I was teaching, you, I, I, you could get a kind of a student in your classroom that could exhaust you because they were never going to capitulate to success. They, they would always find a way to not succeed and they would, and they'd pull you and, and you, you just felt yourself being torn. So I think there's an analogous things can happen in business where you're just, your energy gets sucked away from you Man, so, and, and, and I do say, I mean, it is interesting, but one last thing about Salesforce, kind of a funny story, but Mark is a big supporter of mindfulness as a, as a personal technique. And in fact, at all the offsites, there are monks that come in and lead mindfulness sessions and everybody participates. I mean, it's not like just the, a few, the, the whole thing. And it does change the quality of the environment. 
So the, the reason I bring that up is I think we have to all have personal practices, whatever they are, that restore us because, and, and now in this is age of Zoom, you, you can get, feel your soul get sucked into the, into the, into the <laughs> Zoom. Uh, it's, it's like, no, okay, let me out. So, so I think, again, just, just um, taking care of your energy, uh, I, I think is important. And then, as you said, building alliances. And I think we build alliances on integrity. I think we, we build alliances on, you know, making commitments and keeping them. And, uh, and so finding that core of people that, that keeps their commitments to you and you keep your commitments to them. I think that's really important. And any advice to um, just in general, any takeaways for the listeners? Well, I think, uh, you know, I think in terms of, particularly in terms of future work, this big topic, you know, I think there's anxiety in the culture and any time there's a transition that there's a lot of jobs that are gonna be uh, uh, decimated, a lot of people are gonna be dislocated and in the, in the future of work is gonna become, a, sort of, in the case of AI or machine learning, I, there's some terminator future that's going to you know take away all of the creativity of human beings um so i think so first of all understand in the short term there will be job dislocation and it is very painful and we should do everything we can as a society to mitigate those problems but long term work one way to think of define work is work is all the problems that need to get solved that's the body of work so you ask yourself the question, is work going to diminish? Well, how are we doing with the body of problems? Do we feel like the body of problems is getting smaller or larger? My experience is it's getting larger. And, and in fact, I just feel like there's an infinite set of problems in front of us. So there's an infinite amount of work. So I don't think we're going to run out of work. Now, we, we, the, the fit, but the product market fit between the work that needs to be done and the skills that we have, okay, we're going to have to adjust the product market fit. But it's not that there's going to be a lack of work that's not going to be the problem. I think that the thing is that we need to realign ourselves to perform the future of work, which is different maybe than the past of work. So would you like to leave us with a quote, a favorite quote that you like? Oh uh, gosh. Um, well, okay. If this is the first one that came to mind and it, 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 it relates to being innovative. It's, it's an, it's a proverb. It's an African proverb. And it says, um, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go with others. And I think, you know, it's just knowing which of those games to be playing at the right time. I think that's one of the keys to entrepreneurship. Such a pleasure to talk to you, Jeffrey. Um, and I look forward to, um, you know, reading your book, um, The um, Infinite Staircase. That, does that come out well, next year? I think it's going to come out next year. Yes. The Infinite Staircase. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thank you.